So welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and start um, the first. And of course, that's when the little bell rings for more people coming in. Um, we're going to start this intro to medieval tourneying. This is the first part. Um, I looked at this and we'll do a series of these over time based on um, mostly the primary reference to be using some secondaries, too. Uh, we're going to hit today the early tournaments all the way up from the beginnings, all the way up through William Marshall and well, through William Marshall and up to Edward III and the sort of round table events and the things that he held coming back from France. Um, hopefully that'll give us an idea of what those tournaments really look like um, so that we've got a uh, better picture of how the early ones worked. Uh, we, a little bit monarchical focus on this one because the, um, some of the statutes that Richard, Edward, and, and then some of the things that Edward III do are well documented. Uh, there's a lot of tourneying going on in Northern France and some in the German lands too, and a little, as far away as Sicily, we have less on that. So um, I'm not going to hit as those as much. I'll hit where we have records and we'll extrapolate if we need to. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, there's not a lot of us in the room, so it shouldn't be too hard to, um, to capture those. All right, so let's see. Here's kind of where we're going. We're not going to hit Charnay's three kinds of arms. We'll just hit Charnay at the end. But we'll talk about all these pieces. The piece I did not get woven in here actually were the civic fests. Um, if you remind me when we get down to that section, we'll try to hit that up. Uh, I've been looking at that recently. Uh, so it's kind of interesting content. But we'll go from terms on through. Terms are important and somewhat complicated here because working from a time when people didn't standardize terminology necessarily. Um, and we're also looking at a lot of this, you know, early secondary works where they very roughly translated things. So we'll try to keep the terminology straight as we go, um, but I'll introduce some terms first to get us going. So just me, I've been around for a long time doing this. Um, actually, a lot of the Company of St. George stuff was spurred by an interest in how to get uh, more accurate tournaments, which came out of an interest in um, how to fight more effectively, um, which came out of an interest in armor. So it kind of made the progression here. Um, and tournaments are something that uh, is especially interesting because I think the renown mechanism, as we discussed in the pot arms class, um, plays a role. You can see it clearly even in these early tournaments. So we'll talk about it as we move along today. So a couple of key secondary sources that a lot of this is based on. Um, I use those secondary sources, in other words, sources that are drawn from and analyzed surviving primary sources. I use those as pointers towards the primary sources. So. It's one thing, you know, to agree with the author, but it's a treasure trove. Like if you get the Barker and Barber book on tournaments, this is an, a treasure trove of um, uh, primary sources in the footnotes and such. So um, I've started there a long time ago when this first came out, I bought a copy. And then I've gradually over time acquired copies of the primary sources. And then of course you gotta mess around with reading them and such. So a lot of what you can get here, you can get in a little bit more detail uh, reading through uh, the books I've got here on the secondaries. The first one of these sources is always Maurice Keene's uh, work, Chivalry. He has a couple chapters in there devoted to the tournament. tournament. Some of you are following through and doing the readings with the Skull of St. George. That's, of course, the cornerstone book we use. Um, but the number one tournament book is that Bar Barker and Barber book that I brought up just a second ago. And the number two book is... Whoa, seems to get a little ratty now. You be careful with this one. Uh, this is Juliet Barker book, uh, The Tournament in England. And that's the one on the screen is actually your, um, the more current soft cover version of it. Uh, same version, but uh, just reprinted. Um, and that's her doctoral thesis then turned into a book. It's fantastic. Uh, it only deals with England, however. Um, and so it doesn't really touch too much on what's going on in France, Germany, or any other place. Um, the Barbara and Barker book also focuses mainly on that, but is not exclusively on it. Um, there's another book uh, by Cleffin that you can get from Dover, uh, 19th century, very outdated in terms of a lot of the dating and the suppositions, but some good primary sources included in there. And there's another one by Cripps Day, which I don't think you'll get much out of it if I show it to you, but because it's just a linen cover, but this is a reprint by AMS, early 20th century. Uh, but has a lot of primary sources in it. Again, not so good on the interpretation. And then a one that's probably not thought of as a tournament book, this early one's this one, Edward III and Chivalry, a fine book, um, hard to find, 
um, by Juliet Vale. Um, covers a lot of the tournaments that were going on before Edward III came to the throne and then how he uh, encouraged them in England all around and up to leading to the Order of the Garter, uh, which is kind of where we stopped today too. Um, and these books all point us towards primary sources. So we have uh, Surviving Chronicles and Romances are great sources. Um, romances, of course, have problems in that they're idealizations, but they're also teaching texts. So many, many depictions, depictions without end really, of tournaments and the romances. Chronicles, unfortunately, generally speaking, in the early tournaments especially, they, the extent of the information is there was a tournament here or somebody licensed tournaments there. And, and occasionally you'll get these people took part in the tournament. That's not, that doesn't start in earnest until really the 14th century. So we lose a fair amount of uh, um, traction there. Uh, chivalric biographies, uh, early on the Chanson de William de Marchal uh, is one of the uh, big ones and um, pretty useful if you can find it. Uh, we'll cover that when we get to him. Um, tournament books, there are some surviving ones um, that um, sort of record what was going on, uh, rolls of arms mainly. Um, but there are a few of them in this era. Uh, inventories, when they can be found, this is how we know that Edward I had armor of Kerboyle and they made swords out of whalebone or baleen, so it's not really bone, and then silvered it. And we're using that in lieu of verbated steel. Um, interesting sources, very much more difficult to interpret. They're all in Latin. And of course, the clerks recording these things didn't necessarily have the same uh, sense of precision in terminology that you'll find in some of the other kinds of sources. Uh, similar to those are Harold's recountings of some of these things where they're basically talking about who was at the, the event. Uh, mostly in this early period, they're not discussing the action or what happened. Um, but they'll talk about who participated. Um, and then finally, uh, iconography, very important source for us here because the uh, there might be many, many um, pictures and we'll use a few of them for this. Um, so I can, we can talk more about those as we go. Um, as you get into the 14th and 15th centuries, painting of course becomes more realistic. And so painted images become more accurate. Um, and more useful as sources. And then finally, surviving artifacts. So there are a few artifacts, not really much on the tournament from this period, but a few things, some helms here and there. Um, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the equipment, although uh, we might in another, another, another uh, session. So do I have any questions on the sources? All right. So we're gonna go through some of this terminology pretty quick just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, and these are things that generally, terms that get bannered around and it's good to have a similar idea of what they sort of mean. Outrance is the French term, meaning really without limits. <clears throat> and it's, think of it as fighting or tournaments or jousts for war. And so in general, that's done with people who you're not friendly with. Um, and, but outrance is something of a later term there are all kinds of um, Latin extrap extrapolations for it, but um, starting at least the 16th century, they use that term and possibly in the 15th. Uh, not really a term early on, but we use it to classify things so it makes it easier to keep in mind kind of what the tone was on some of these tournaments. Uh, a plaisance, the next one down, is the opposite. It means uh, a piece, and that's where you'd find you know, rebated weapons and um, coronels on lances instead of sharp points, whereas in all trance you have sharp points, sharp swords, etc. Um, and yeah, early tournaments were fought sometimes all trance or all tranza in the Italian. Um, so um, they'll sometimes declare how their intention is to meet. Um, knight errant is just basically the concept of a knight going around from place to place, earning renown uh, through their um, uh, through their uh, actions. So. Um, you'll see a little bit of that shown here. And then the idea of renown just gives some more English terms or some other terms for it, renown and the French worshipfulness, if you're reading English terms, they often put it in that phrase, Middle English anyway, reputazione in Italian and fama in Latin. Fama also has some legal connotations to it um, that come from renown. Uh, Berfoy is a viewing gallery. Um, there are ones as early as uh, some of these early tournaments we're talking about, especially constructed out of wood and cloth, uh, so that the spectators, chiefly ladies, but heralds as well, can watch the action. Um, and then the lists, most of us are familiar with that term, uh, usually a fenced area, 
Uh, SCA folks would be used to the rope and stake sort of arrangement. Um, Deeds of arms folks would be more familiar with the sort of fence fence kind of arrangement. And it's a list whether it's on foot or, or whether it's on horseback. Early on, the lists weren't necessarily roped in, they were just declared, but initially they were roped in. Uh, Vespers is a special kind of tournament that's held the night before the main tournament. We find it a lot in 13th century German sources. Um, and it's a preliminary, it's a martial event. It's like a, almost like a novice tournament for squires. Um, and we probably won't talk about it too much, but it's, if you dig in this a little bit, you'll see the term. Uh, the common say was sort of a, an invocation at the beginning and then a first fight, a chance to introduce yourself, etc. Uh, melee is obviously a group combat and an estoc or a coup de grace. The estoc is a thrusting weapon and the term estoc uh, means to thrust. And you'll find that as soon as we get to Edward III, or Edward I rather, they start to make rules against thrusts in tournaments um, because they don't want the lethality. Um, so that bans points on swords and it also bans lances. You know, not unfamiliar safety requirements or safety concerns uh, that we might have today. Um, so we'll run into these terms as we go. Um, now, there's some other ones here that are sort of higher level concepts that are more important. The tournament itself, um, broadly called in Latin, a hasteludum or a tournamenteus, uh, is, can be a general term or it can be a specific term. If it's a general term, it can, it's sometimes taken to mean all of the kinds of tournament that we'll talk about. Um, but it more specifically means, refers to the melee tournament, specifically the melee section of the tournament. Um, and so this could be outrants, it could be aplazance. It's usually declared which way it's going to be. Normally they were aplazance, but early on that's not always the case. Um, and you have two equal groups contending. Uh, normally on horseback, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, references and none in this era for foot tournaments. Um, although you will see images of people on the ground in the 15th century fighting. Um, and there are instances like in the Manessa Alter, uh, Codex from 1340, where you have people on the ground fighting. I think there was some of that, um, but it, it's hard to classify and decode from the surviving Latin sources. Uh, so tournaments a group combat thing. Started off the 11th century and will continue on. If you picture those big King René sort of tournaments, they're uh, common in there as well. Uh, the joust, on the other hand, is what we think of it as, as two horsemen sort of uh, riding towards one another. The caveat is that the, the barrier down the center didn't exist prior to the um, late 14th century. And it's actually a Portuguese invention. Um, so a joust was really two horsemen riding at each other without the benefit of a barrier. Um, and that can be obviously um, a fair amount of uh, collision involved in that. And that's part of the thing that they're trying to, um, trying to eliminate. That also can be outrance or outplaisance, depending. And they even had jousts with small groups of guys, three on three, say, or five on five, jousting together. At that point, it starts to blend with the tournament. Um, and of course, as I say, they weren't precise with the terminology necessarily all the time. Um, but these are terms we'll run into and talk about here. Now, the joust really came out of the tournament and started off a century later, and then, of course, persists all the way up till well, today. And all of these are contrasted with a duel. Uh, duels are one-on-one -on -one encounter, um, usually almost always between enemies or legal contenders, um, fought always uh, trance without limits, uh, while the limits are, there are limits specified in the terms, usually by the, set by the judge. And this usually decides a legal issue. And it's an issue where um, it's kind of a he said, she said thing. There isn't proof, and they didn't consider proof the same way we do, but proof of a person who can speak um, convincingly to the jury. So if two people are of equal sort of social uh, renown or reputation, then they have the option to opt for a duel, a judicial duel sometimes. This goes out of practice in England in about the 12th century, and it persists a little bit into the 15th century uh, and through the 15th century in Europe itself, uh, but it's going out of fashion. We do see it though, in a lot of the fighting treatises, Hens Talhofer and Paulus Cal at least, are discussing a judicial duel um, in when they present what their feats of arms were. Um, there are duels of honor, but they're very, very uncommon. And the book, The Last Duel, covers the last one in the 15th century, but they were still, it implies a level of anger that was not usually pleasant, not usually present in a pot arms or a joust or a tournament. Um, although certainly in a tournament outrance or a joust outrance, you're 
blending the line there, whether it becomes a dual or not. Uh, but dual usually has a specific set of meanings to it. Um, pot arms is kind of the flip side of that. It's a challenge a plaisance. Um, it can be on foot, but a lot of them, most of them were on horseback. Uh, we discussed that in the other class, so we won't spend too much time on it, but a very popular thing for the companies, and um, nowadays there are some of them in the SCA too, so that's good. A uh, round table is really a festival. Um, it's not a tournament per se. It's a festival at which there is fighting. And oftentimes the fighting is up. Usually it's up plaisance. In fact, I don't think I found any examples of round tables where it wasn't. It didn't start off at least out of although sometimes it spilled over into violence. Um, but people would come and pretend to be, there'd be like a king who might be um, pretending to be Arthur or one of the other Arthurian kings. And other people would play the roles of other of Arthur's knights or other kings. Um, and there's a storyline usually that follows in a round table. Sometimes that's true of pot arms too, um, but generally speaking, the round table is all kinds of things. The festival has dinners and feasts. We'll go through it more uh, when we get down into the lesson, but uh, a round table is kind of a different thing. You might find jousts and bay hordes and tournaments at a round table is the way to think of it. So the round table might be your Penzik or your Gulf War, um, whereas these other feats of arms happen at that would be a fair analogy. Uh, the Combat of 30 is not a type of tournament, it's a thing that happened once. Uh, it was outrance. Uh, it was informal, it wasn't Satan, it was neither sanctioned nor really declared amongst anybody except the combatants. Um, and it was done during a, a break in the Hundred Years' War between two um, garrisons that were bored. And so they decided to fight with each other. Um, and it turned out they got a lot of renown for doing that. We won't cover it in this class because it's after the period we're talking about, but it's something you might run into before. And I bring it up here in part because it's a kind of a form that spawned kind of this whole um, by hurt kind of um, combat form in Europe and ACL, BOTN, all those kind of guys in the US. Uh, what they're doing is very close to what the combat of the 30 were doing um, in the surviving records we have. And we can contrast that with the Bay Horde, which um, is much more enigmatic. Uh, most sources, though, agree that it's um, almost definitely always a plaisance, although they got out of hand as well. Sometimes they're th thought of as sort of squires tournaments or juniors tournaments, um, but most often they were at least fought with rebated weapons and very often, at least prior to the mid 15th century, it seems like they were fought with batons um, or ash weapons. So not unlike the SCA rattan stuff, I would argue, we're gonna end on something like that or come pretty close to it by the time we get done with this. And then finally, the last kind of version is the emprise. Um, also a plaisance, and it's a formal challenge between two combatants. Usually you get them between someone in England and someone in France, and they'll exchange a bunch of letters as to how they're going to accomplish this feat of arms. Uh, and unfortunately, the ones that survive in, in the records, it's not really a duel because they don't like each other. You'll see when they're um, looking at the um, records themselves, which you'll do in a different class, that they are very fond of one another, but they're trying to set up this big sort of feet, formal feat of arms and it has to be legal, has to be licensed and has to be watched over by a royal entity uh, or a noble entity. And very often, you know, the guys, there are cases where they threw one, they came to all this, did months worth of work or even years in some cases, came to the site, threw one blow and the, the king or the duke throws down the baton. You've done enough. Um, and it was also recorded they weren't very happy about that. Um, sometimes they weren't allowed to do it at all. But you'll see over the beginnings, the beginnings we're talking about a tournament uh, and then they start to refine that with a joust. So it's not just two bunches of horsemen running between towns. Um, and gradually there's more and more structure and less and less um, just sort of free brawling. And that's sort of the broad brush that they go through until you get rid of the tournament altogether by the third quarter of the 15th century. And it's just individual combats um, focused on the joust and very expensive encounters as well. You have some exceptions like Henry VIII's and Francis the first field of cloth of gold where they're there fighting on foot, but mostly they're horse combats. So this is sort of the spectrum of uh, what medieval tournaments really are. So we say tournaments kind of can either mean the specific thing or it can mean all of these um, things together, depending on what you're talking about. Do you have any questions on these? There's a lot of terms here, so feel free. Most of them we're gonna, or a number of them we're gonna cover in the rest of the class, but if you have a question, pop up with it. All right. Let's go on then. So the purpose of the tournament came out of the development of new technology, the stirrup, the canted saddle, the heavy lance, um, and the need for horsemen to stay together in the charge. To make all of the heavy cavalrymen effective, 
they needed to stay together. There's a reference that says they needed to stay together tightly enough that no one could drop a scarf in the middle of the midst of the horseman and it would fall to the ground. It would fall on someone. So very tightly packed sort of charges are necessary to make this sort of thing work. And that, of course, required practice. They didn't have standing armies the way we have. So there's no, you know, going out five days a day and drilling. So what they had was experiential practice and practice where the expertise developed. And tournaments were uh, developed as, at least it's thought, as a place where training and practice could be done. So these technological things uh, are one vector. Another vector is that the nobles might want to get together for various reasons. And if you're getting together in arms, that might be a concern to the sovereign. And it turns out to be a concern as we see going forward here. Um, so multiple reasons, but there were cavalry games and such in the Arabic lands and in the Roman lands and, and in the, what we think of sort of as the dark ages, there were cavalry games, but uh, it's not thought of as a medieval tournament proper. And the records, the medieval records anyway, tend to start off with this piece. Geoffrey de Puy, who invented tournaments, was killed in the year 1062. There are actually two sources that corroborate this. Now, he didn't invent, you know, horsemanship and horse games and all that, but he is credited in northern France um, with the creation of the tournament structure the way it was. And we'll talk about what that structure was. Um, so maybe not the best renown earned from the fact that you invented this thing, but in fact you were killed by it. Uh, that, of course, is recorded by churchmen, so not really a big surprise there. Churchmen, as we'll see, were almost uniformly opposed to this practice for a variety of reasons. Um, and so this is where the form, the conflicticus gallicus, um, or the hastaludum, as it was sometimes called, would have two groups of horsemen armed for war, uh, fighting between two geographical points, usually two towns. So between Westchester and another town located some leagues away, with a couple raidouts where you could rearm and uh, rest and that sort of thing. And it would be held, say, all week. So it's a week of cavalry maneuvers is basically what's going on here. Um, but there's no, a very few, if any, rules. Which rules there were, were agreed upon by the combatants before, uh, before they engaged. And we have almost no records of that. Uh, we know that uh, there are some hints that this thing, kind of thing might have been done, but no actual records. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to look at. Uh, but we know that generally the term, the form of the tournament will uh, take this form and continue all the way through the mid-15th century. Uh, but the, you can picture the destructiveness with two groups of horsemen just running amok on uh, fertile farmland between two towns. Um, obviously, you're going to have all kinds of complaints from, from landholders in there, from villagers, from churchmen. Uh, there's records of them running over, um, you know, stands of grapes and uh, wrecking, setting fire to things and all kinds of, there's not a big line, in other words, between battle and what this tournament thing is. And of course, the guy who invented them supposedly was killed. So um, this is a rough and tumble thing. Uh, Juliet Barker calls it a simulacra of battle. So everything about a battle except maybe intent to kill. And because some of these groups didn't like each other, fighting all Tronza, there might have been that too. So the dividing line between war and battle um, and a clash and what a tournament is, is just not very big. Uh, there really isn't one initially. And then gradually over time, we'll see that line gets bigger and bigger. So we have a record from 1127 for Charles uh, the Good of Flanders. Uh, Flanders is well known as a tournament hotspot. Uh, people would go from all over Europe and England to go to tournaments in Flanders, uh, which is interesting because, of course, the Low Countries are an area where the urban culture will grow very strong, very fast. Uh, in the Low Countries, you have an urban and a rural culture side by side. So you have a country nobility that's just like it is in France and in England but you also have a rising urban elite in the towns in Flanders, uh, which will create a bunch of friction, of course. Um, and so here's the quote, frequented, uh, Charles frequented tournaments in Normandy and in France and outside that kingdom too, and so kept his knights exercised in time of peace and extended thereby his fame and glory and that of his country. Um, right off the bat, we see that renown is attached to it um, because they're talking about keeping the knights exercised, in other words, ready for war, practiced, et cetera, uh, but also that it's extending his fame and glory, um, his renown, um, enough so that it was captured in a treatise that we find and can show today. So he's still earning renown from that all the way back to 1127. Um, this is in Barker and Barber 16, if you're looking for that. Um, 
And then everything about this is very much as it was in war. So captures and ransoms, et cetera, even sometimes footbowmen, footmen, crossbowmen, and, some, and somewhat included in the, in the proceedings. And what the difference is between that and war, particularly in private war, it's not really clear. I guess this one's declared and you say where you're gonna fight. Beyond that, there isn't a lot of difference. Uh, but you know, if you argue you train as you fight, then this is pretty good training probably, pretty solid training. Are there any comments on this or questions? I've got one regarding the crossbowman. Go for it. So given that ideally you're not actually killing everyone on the other side, would the crossbowmen have potentially used different ammunition for this? There's no record of that. Um, probably they were used as a deterrence. So you put them over here and I can't use that terrain is most likely what it was. Because um, of course you don't want to kill the horse because you're going for captures and ransoms. So um, you don't necessarily want to kill your opponent. I think the only difference here between this and war is the intent to actually kill. And crosswomen do throw that in. It's very rare. We have two instances where there were crosswomen um, actually reported to be there. And both times it was thought of as, hey, that's kind of not okay. Um, but nonetheless, they are mentioned at least twice. And these are in the surviving records, so it probably happened more than twice. But no record of unusual or different ammunition, like, say, our bird blunts or anything like that. Anyone else on this one? All righty, so the early thing, very much like war. Um, and we're looking all the way from 100 years or 60 years here, and then we'll see it goes on further than that. Oh, right, and we missed this one. Uh, it was really focused in Northern France. Um, that's where Perlou was from, being the Chronicle of Tours. Um, and there was a kind of a band from Paris up to Low Countries where this was very, very hot and extending west to Normandy. Knights would come from all over the place, from Germany or the German lands anyway, from Italian lands, from Sicily, um, from Spain to for the Spanish areas to fight in these tournaments. Um, and they would bring the groups of men with them, little conroi, as they're called away in the Marshall's Day. Um, but of course, the practice quickly spreads. You find it everywhere, as far away as Syria, after the Crusades anyway, um, and in the reconquered kingdoms, uh, Sicily, all up and down the Italian peninsula in S Spanish areas and Portugal, um, and then all England, and potentially even northwards. Um, we don't really have a lot of details on a lot of those places, but they are mentioned at least as occurring. So what you had is the growth of an international tournament circuit uh, where you could basically go out every fortnight by the mid 13th century and just do tourneying. And we'll talk about why you might do that. So the famous figure that strides onto the field pretty boldly in this is William the Marshall. Uh, this book by George Duby is probably the one I'd recommend to get started on Marshall. Um, there are a bunch more complicated ones. Um, he left us his uh, Chanson de Guillaume Le Marshal, this thing, which is actually three volumes. Um, it's not easy to find. Uh, it's translated nicely side by side, though. And it's got some amazing descriptions of things. Uh, at one point, Marshall took enough blows to his close helmet that, uh, or his helm, that he had to be pulled out seek a blacksmith out so he could unbend the thing from around his head and he could get it off. That's the, the um, story anyway. Um, the marshal was active a little bit after this, 1170s and 80s. Um, we've got the records, the first of the really strong Schwarzenegger biographies, obviously not written, it's not an autobiography, but it was written about him. Like all the biographies, it tends to want to celebrate what was actually done and how they wanted them remembered. So there's probably a lot of uh, let's say color added to the text. Um, but I think there are places where you can really pull out what may have really happened if you triangulate that with other sources. Um, Marshall's is particularly good. Um, there are parallels with romances. Um, and this is meant as a kind of romance, but they didn't draw the distinction we do between romance and history and fiction. They're all blended together in a kind of mythography. So this was intended very much to signal um, the marshal's renown and seal it for all eternity, and it has in fact done that. So his first tournament in 1167, he borrows a horse, loses it, um, and over, over the next two years, he'll form a little corporation with his Conra, and he'll earn an amazing amount of money doing this, plus he'll uh, earn a, a huge reputation. He was a second son or a third son, I don't recall which, um, and because of this, he was catapulted into a position of prominence. Um, he went on that tournament circuit in Northern France, 
um, into Flanders and the German lands and then back into England, uh, mostly in Fran northern France and Flanders, though. Um, and as we'll see, Richard I wants to bring these tournaments to England. There were some before that, but not, not a lot of them. Um, and so um, Marshall's really the prototype of this. So these are bands of horsemen, remember, that are fighting other bands of horsemen uh, for, for gain. And although they're set up in two sides, his group forms a smaller team within a team, and their sole focus is on earning money and uh, grabbing folks. And they're very effective at this. Uh, and it earns a lot of pages in the Chronicle. If we had more time, I'd go through some of those. Um, and this brings up how he leverages his tournament renown to build, uh, to improve his lot, improve his stars, if you think of um, the Knight's Tale. Um, he gets a good marriage, he rises, eventually becomes an Earl and Regent of England, uh, but he's always known for that renown. He'll take a little detour in there and go on crusade. Um, so uh, Marshall's really effective at, at participating at it. He's viewed as sort of the top, uh, the uh, Dr. J of, uh, sort of jousting, and or not jousting, but tournaments. And he's not doing a lot of single combats in here. These are mostly the group melees. Uh, there are jousts going on at this time, a few of them, but mostly it's still group to group. So Marshall's a pretty good uh, sort of anchor for looking at this early uh, history of the tournament and such. Oh, I wanted to go back. Well, won't let me do it. All right, so um, you can see where two groups of horsemen might actually cause a problem. Uh, Richard I, who of course comes along right after uh, right in the era that Marshall's around. If you think of Lion and Winter, of course, they're both featured as characters there. Um, famous King Richard, he, uh, and this is a William of Newburgh citing Richard. The famous King Richard, observing the extra training and instruction of the French, has made them correspondingly fiercer in war, wished that the knights of his kingdom should train in their own lands. In other words, instead of having to go to France and Flanders and such, so they can learn from turning the art and custom of war, and so that the French could not insult the English knights from being crude and less skilled. He wants to do his own maneuvers, his own red flag, his own uh, sort of um, uh, set of exercises to make his own knights as competent as the ones he saw in France. Whether or not this is the real reason he did it or not is not clear. It is clear though that very soon after this, Richard licensed five sites and tournaments in England to do tournaments. There were tournaments before that. And part of the concern with the tournaments with an armed baronage in England is that they will be doing other things other than fighting tournaments. Their meeting is a large armed group that the crown doesn't control. Um, and so part of the reason for his licensing is to uh, try to control that group. Of course, John, when he comes to the throne, will ban tournaments. Um, he's obviously terrified of the barons. Um, and then it won't be until um, Edward I steps up where these things really get going again in England. Um, they happen uh, you know, over John's objections, but um, they're definitely toned down quite a lot. So you can see an intent here for the crown to try and control these things and leverage all this sort of military energy that's going on in the kingdom and use it for his own ends. Um, at the same time, if Newburgh is correct, he's also trying to improve, use that as a training method um, to improve what's going on. Because I figure if you don't have tournaments, how are your knights gonna learn? Um, there's no drill that you can really learn for this. Um, it wasn't in the culture anyway. So uh, this is really the only way that you're going to get in practice for war. Um, so Richard's uh, affordably famous for that. This is the licensing I already talked about. Um, but it's, you know, more of a problem even than the secular crown. The church didn't like it. At the Council of Claremont in 1130, they declare what they called the peace and truce of God. And they state, in Latin, of course, this is translated, we firmly prohibit those detestable markets or fairs at which knights are accustomed to meet to show off their strength and their boldness and at which the deaths of men and dangers to the soul often occur. Letting somebody in. But if anyone is killed there, even if he demands and is not denied penance and viaticum, ecclesiastical burial shall be withheld from him. Um, so the church will take a stand on this that is um, definitely negative. Uh, can you think of any reasons why that might be the case? I mean, you're training to kill, and I'm pretty sure one of the commandments is thou shalt not commit murder. Right. There's that aspect right off the bat, and we can, you know, go around back and forth on murder and kill. But nonetheless, the older church is pacifist, although you're starting to get to the time where the crusades are on, they're starting to shift a little bit. But yes, the killing is definitely a part, part of the problem. They state that right in there. So that's one aspect. You think of anything else? 
I'm not sure how developed uh, the concept of courtly romance was at this point. So that might be a very, uh, that might be that danger to the soldier. Well, right. They're looking at uh, those detestable markets or fairs. Now, normally, since the church ran a lot of markets and fairs, they're not opposed to markets and fairs. But things happen there that don't stay there. So um, they're concerned about that, too. Um, and they see that also where they say the dangers, deaths of men, as you mentioned, and also dangers to the soul. That's what they're talking about. So drinking, partying, other sort of things that happen in Vegas, right? So this is what they're kind of looking at as not one either. The other thing is they're trying to run crusades to retrieve and sustain the Holy Lands. This is sapping martial energy from that. And so they declare successively uh, until the mid 14th century that they're opposed to this. Um, and they try denying church burial, they try excommunication, uh, but none of it works. The guys keep on turning anyway, even despite that. Um, in England, Richard had an easier time licensing it. There was no such licensing in Flanders or in France or in the German lands or any other place we know of. That was just England. Uh, but the papacy tried to rein it in for a considerable amount of time and did not succeed. Um, and this was just not the kind of knighthood that the church thought was um, useful. Obviously, if it were training for war and then that training was being put to use in the Crusades, they might have been for that, but that's not the dynamic they see. So um, they stand as opposed to this, whereas the secular authorities were trying to find ways to leverage this, at least Richard was in England. Um, we'll see Edward I do a similar thing as well. So entering the 13th century, this is where you see a ton of these events, and they start to become much larger now. In the uh, Tournoi de Covency miniature we see here, you've got pavilions, you've got ladies overwatching this. You'll see this also in the 1340s Manessa Codex that we looked at in the Pot Arms um, in the uh, section. Um, and you've got jousting. Um, they're having, the events are starting to become bold enough to where they're multi-day affairs. And on the first couple of days, there's jousting, but then they culminate in a group sort of tournament of some sort. And that tournament becomes more and more focused until the people here can actually see it by the 13th century. So now there's at least a place. Um, the Richard, uh, the first licensing probably helped that, defining certain spots for where it's gonna occur. Um, but this also appears to be the tradition, whether or not you know, Richard gets credit for any of that or not is, is unclear. Um, but certainly you're now seeing it as a focused kind of event with other people taking part, particularly heralds and ladies as spectators, but also youths and you know merchants and people like that. Um, a good example of this is the Turnwater Covency in 1285. There's a surviving um, masterful sort of um, uh, recounting of this by a herald named Jacques Bretel, um, who's contemporary with this and was apparently at the event. Uh, most of what he's talking about is who jousted. And there are a lot of names in here. I think there are 90 names that he discusses. So this is the size of you know, a large crown tournament in the SCA or what have you. Um, but it's in this particular tournament, there were joust Monday to Wednesday, and then a big melee on Thursday. You don't do anything on Friday. Um, and pretty normal. Um, this might be one of the ones where crosswomen showed up. I don't really remember. I don't think so. Um, but um, well, maybe that was Laham. I don't remember. One of those two, I think. Um, and But this is kind of becoming the template. And you can see the rudiments now for the King Rene kind of pot arms tournament that you saw later. Um, and that you've got these groups of horsemen in the image, you can see they're all bedecked in um, heraldic uh, splendor. In fact, you can't really see the armor at all uh, for the heraldry. And that's for identification purposes, whether or not it was necessary. This is a period where they've got closed helmets up through the sugar loaf um, and then almost always crests on their sugar loaf. So, um, big, bold heraldic displays. You see a lot of coronets on the ladies in the stands, probably more than there actually were, but they're up above everyone else. And you can see they're watching from what appears to be a castle, but there's pavilions all back here. So the tourniers come to camp out and stuff, much like a Penzik or a Gulf War. Um, and then people watching the proceedings here. Um, so an interesting event. Uh, also during that period of the 13th century, you'll get Edward I coming to the throne in England. And he's been described by Arthur Sandos as an Arthur, Arthurian enthusiast. Um, he starts his turning off at the tender age of 17 or so in, in 1258. Uh, that first tournament was actually a bay horde, so it was fought with clubs and linen armor. Um, but that's how he gets his first taste of it. And what Edward I will do is he will leverage the sort of 
uh, draw to combat and all the energy of the of the tournament into a way to help them legitimize the reign because there were obviously struggles going on um, with the Barons War and the, the revolt in Wales and so on in, in, in Ireland. Um, so he will leverage and make some of these things kind of Arthurian uh, formed. He will also, through the Statute of Memoriam, he'll add a set of rules from the crown that actually regulate the fighting. Richard's rules didn't regulate the fighting, they regulated the, um, where the fighting can happen. Um, but in the Statutum, it says where you're going to do it. It says how you're going to do it. You can only have six people or X people in a conwa, so no giant teams. So out of this, you get smaller sort of units working together. Um, and then he declared some of the weapons that you would use they, very frequently. And in this, I think this is one of the cases where they uh, banned weapons that can use, um, be used in the S-Dock or the thrust. So you could joust, but you would have to have a coronel on the, on the uh, lance. Now, in this period, we're still talking about, in 1292, we're still talking about only male for the armor. So the shield's pretty darn important when you're jousting with only male, especially. Um, you've got the helm fitted either over a cask, a small, uh, like, proto-bassinet or a bassinet um, going on over that, all the way up through the 1340s and 50s, that's true. Um, so now you're, I mean, if you can, in fact, if you look at these figures, you don't actually see any augmentation of the male. That's just what they're wearing. Um, so Edward represents what was happening also on the continent where they were trying to take these battles and basically make them a little bit more controlled and focused. So you have fewer deaths. And maybe this is a somewhat of a bow to what the church was saying, where they're, they're too violent and they're too destructive. You know, people are running over things. They're setting fire to things. They're stealing things. We don't want that. So it makes it more and more structured event. Um, and Edward, of course, from the crown's point of view, tries to regulate it as Richard did for his own benefit. But he was an enthusiast um, as well. Uh, Richard is known to have fought in tournaments as well. Uh, in fact, he was tutored by William Marshall in his early years. So kind of an interesting overlay there as well. Uh, any questions on those before we go on or comments? All right. Also during the 13th century, uh, the, the Round Table Festival begins to be established. Um, our Edward I was very popular in doing this, um, and they would set up, as I said, they would take on the roles of figures, and then they would have fighting events happen during that fest, as best we can tell. Now, the names flex a little, so you might have an event that's called a round table where people are using a theme. Edward III came one time as Edward as the Pope, and some of his key knights as cardinals came and took on all comers. Um, and the captains on the other side came as the sins. Um, so you have other themes other than Arthurian stuff, but the whole festival kind of thing is thought of as a round table. And these blend feasts and some theater kind of things, some presentations, some invocations, uh, prize giving and fighting all together into a martial event. But it's built around a theme typically and it, and it tells a story from end to end. So there's a powerful element of drama running through the round table itself which may or may not have been carried out onto the field. In some cases, it's clear that people had special armor made. Um, Edward I was fond of going as Lionel. Um, so he had all sorts of Lionel stuff made up um, that he fought in. We've got tons of inventory records about this. Um, and then other times they would simply have a horde at the event. In these two images from Lancelot Lock in 1340, notice here the coronel on his lance. Um, showing that it's very much, and there's, if you look down in here, these are actually, it says Behord in here. Um, and then down here, you see the group melee event, um, and then you see some jousting in front of it. So it's a really good outline for everything they're doing here. You have the ladies watching over the events. Um, you have, which of course, if you're going to see it from the castle, you have to restrict the space. So this is where the fence idea will, will come from. The idea of a list is that you've got to have space for people to actually watch this and not spill out into the audience as much. Um, so um, it's important to say it's a blend, as I mentioned, it's a blending thing. Uh, they'll have bay hordes at these sometimes. We'll talk about those more in a couple slides, um, but it's everything together. So um, you could declare a round table and then have jousting in it. Or in our era, we could have fighting at the barrier. We could have defending the castle of love. All those kind of things could be done in an overall round table. To me, to really qualify for a round table and not just to be a pod, pod arms, you really need that story connecting it in some way. I'm not sure that's a historical thing, but it's a useful kind of separator now. When you look at the historical stuff though, it's all 
blended and mixed together, so it's a little bit hard to read. Um, this tournament at La Hem in 1278 was a good example. Notice it's before the other one that we talked about. Um, at Covency, there doesn't appear to be any theme or story or anything like that. But at La Hem in 1278, the whole thing was an Arthurian festival. And they built it around one of Chetrenne de Troyes stories, uh, Yvain or the Night of the Lion. So they actually brought in a lion, so they said. Um, now, whether it was a real lion or, you know, a costume or something, I don't know. But, um, and then frequently they'll have uh, dwarfs in the, in the mix of this, just the way that they're recorded in the romances. So in round tables, you start to see a lot of blending between the romance tales and how the fighting is being done. And this parallels what's being done in sort of the area of ideas, where the sort of warrior ideas are coming together and blending with the church ideas and with the court ideas and the sort of romantic ideas. It's also happening on the tournament field at the same time. And Lahem is a really good example of that. Unfortunately, both Covency and Lahem we have good chronicles for, but they're still in old French, so a little tough. Um, Edward III will use these a lot to celebrate his victories. Um, and these will become really raucous royal events. So the king as a party animal uh, would not be an overstatement here. Um, the church will, of course, take umbrage to this. We get down to Edward. So any commentary on the, or the 13th century tournament or round tables? So the church didn't like them very much. This is a um, Bavaria from early 14th century, 1325, talking about the evils that happen, that can happen um, and then should be avoided, especially at these kind of events. So the first one, it's harder to see in the upper corner here, but that's actually a mirror. So this is vanity. Um, and it, you're you know, looking at fancy dress and stuff. 1325 is not early enough to have fitted garments. Those really came in in the 1350s or so. Um, the church will really object to that when they come in. Um, but the frivolity, hunting, church didn't think much of that. The knights would argue, yeah, but it's practice for war, so we're gonna do it anyway. We've done it forever, we're gonna keep doing it. And then the, all the frivolity that happens around the feast tables with you know, genders mixing and so on, um, and gluttony and all the rest of it. Um, but at the bottom, of course, also is tourneying, and the fact that some of these tournaments began as tournaments, but then became battles. Um, even if that didn't happen, though, the church, some members of the church especially saw it as violence, and they were um, opposed to it. Here's a bigger picture of the, oh, it's not very clear, it's unfortunate, um, of the actual fighting guys. You can see the same sort of stuff, big shield, um, and sort of conical helmets. That's probably aren't, strictly speaking, accurate, but... Um, sort of get an idea of what the church was opposed to here. Um, again, these are all equestrian events. There's no one on foot on anything that we're going to talk about here uh, up to 1350. So now uh, I want to hit one more um, style thing, the Bay Horde. This is trickier because some clerical sources and some heraldic sources tend to mix up tournaments and bay hordes. We don't actually know whether there was a clear distinction historically, but we do know that this practice started um, early on. So these are various terms, and there's more than this. Um, Bredicium, sorry, uh, Latin, and then bay horde, bay hordes, bay hordes, bay hordes, bay hordes, bay hordes. You've seen all, some of those on some of the modern Russian and ACL kind of stuff. Um, that's different names for it. There are more than that. There's probably another 10 or 12 terms for it. Um, so actually defining this turns out to be something of a challenge. Uh, we do know that Edward I had specific armor made for this activity, uh, made it in corboily with uh, quilted linen uh, for a tournament at Windsor um, in 1278. He also had that earlier one. He fought in a, was a Bay Horde as well. They actually made leather, boiled leather helmets for this, not just leather, but boiled leather, uh, which made me think, hmm, maybe we could use boiled leather helmets for a skull kind of context. Um, and then... Uh, same thing with the carasses. Carasses of body defense, so probably a pair of plates fitting over the mail, um, or maybe no mail at all. Um, decorated with bells, and these things were silvered. Uh, some of them were actually done in gold. Um, and then the swords here were covered in baleen. That's the the fle flexible stuff that comes from a uh, sperm whale. Um, can't obviously get a hold of it today. It's highly, highly, highly illegal because um, of the protection of whales, but it was very common that they used it almost like plastic. Um, and so they've got these swords that they could be more uh, free with. And this dovetails, of course, remember Edward I is the one that talked about the Statuto Memorum and the um, 
trying to make these things safer. Well, this Behord was part of that potentially. Um, very common, this thing, these things were not called out like a big special tournament. They weren't usually or always licensed. Um, so a much smaller scale thing. Um, mostly like, you can think of it almost in some ways militia maneuvers. Um, they also would hold Behords at big tournaments and bachelor knights and squires could take part in those. So in some sense, they were thought of sometimes as bachelor um, or as uh, novice tournaments. Um, it's interesting because they, because of the use of batons, which you see all the way up through uh, King Rene in the pot arms class we did, um, this might be an interesting analog for rattan that the SEA uses. Um, if we think of it more as a bay horde than as what the weapons will actually do. Now, I know a lot of people would object to that strenuously based on the fact that they want to be fighting with swords, not sticks. Um, and we're doing, you know, they don't have spears and things of that sort. Uh, all true. Uh, but it, at the core art, the way the rattan system works does seem to me to be very similar to what they were trying to do. And for the same reasons, they were trying to restrict the lethality and still get as much of the martial stuff in it as they could. Um, and I think it's a good way to go and it's worked well in an SCA context. Um, so I wonder if that might not be something that um, gets kicked around. Do I have comments on that? I must. So on that last bit, the newest version for the Marshall's Handbook does allow for variation in tournament rules specifically. Sure. Yeah, that's actually been in there for a little while um, because of these other things coming about. I'm not talking about a variation so much as if you think about what SCA fighting with rattan really is, I would argue it's it's closest historical analog is probably this. Hey, uh, I always thought that was kind of a funny word, uh, behor. Does anybody yeah. actually like study the etymology of it or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, it's tough. Um, I've, I've got a couple sources that claim studies from Bordis, which initially they claim meant lance if they're correct but it could also mean board as in you know eating at the boards or meeting a board um so nothing definitive has been done and the problem is that because these terms weren't used consistently it makes it really really hard um so much like other things what modern scholars have tried to do is say okay here's what we think it is and the first one to really argue this um in the modern era, it was Juliet Barker, and it was then reflected in Richard Barber's book as well, and others have taken it up. Um, earlier writers, particularly in the 17th century, were calling all tournaments bay hordes. Um, that clearly is not the case or accurate, but that was describing historical practice, so I'm not sure how good a record they would have actually had. But no, I haven't seen a consistent one. There is one that exists in a article by uh, Denholm Young, where he takes and assigns it to meaning lance. But that's a very old meaning that predates the tournament, so it's not really necessarily clear. And Juliet Barker, the more recent expert book on that, doesn't concur with that. Um, so, and she doesn't concur with it because the descriptions of the Bay Horde don't usually include lances. And if they did, they were not even just coronel, but sometimes just wooden capped. So, um, it seems like there really was, it was, at least for a time, it was a, an effort to make it safer while still preserving the martial aspect. But I agree with you. It's a funny term. Um, it's obviously not an English word. Um, and it's not really, you'll see it in German text. You'll see it in French text. You'll see it to a limited degree in Middle English texts. Um, and you see it in Latin texts all the time. I'd question the Latin text because they may not know what the specific terminology is if they're not you know, participants but that may be an erroneous assumption. Yeah, there's certainly more work there, and I've got on my docket for next year, one of the papers I want to do in an academic sense is chasing this down, um, because I think it needs to be done. Yeah, I'd be interested in reading that when it comes out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so. yeah. Anybody else on this one? I know it is kind of a radical idea, but I did do an article on this, oh gosh, back in probably 2003 and submitted it to Tournaments Illuminated and it got rejected. Not applicable is what they said. So. All right, moving on. So moving into the middle part of the 14th century brings us to Edward III. Probably best not to talk about Edward II. Um, 
there were tournaments going on during that time. Edward III started out at age 16 participating in these things. Edward II tried to use it like his father had done to legitimize the realm, but even that couldn't help it, and he wasn't very good at it. Uh, he couldn't fight, for one thing, and that makes it really hard to uh, do these things because you have to not only patronize the thing, you also got to be a predominant person. Uh, one notable thing here is that the prizes on these things generally went to the highest ranking people. So we talked in the book study the other day about how, you know, renown can affect judge tournaments. Well, that's not new. Um, that's, in fact, the prize, you'd probably usually expect to see who the prize is going to go to. It wasn't really until the 16th century when they started to do sort of jousting checks and virtually anyone come up and win by points. Um, there are other instances, but a very few. Uh, in the main, these the victors of these things were just, you know, the person that scooped up the most horses and stuff. But once you start to actually have these things be royally run, you do select a victor, and that victor ends up being somebody famous, generally speaking. So Edward will use these tournaments, I think, for a dual purpose. If you look at the literature on this, you'll see some people who argue that Edward was just trying to build, you know, political legitimacy, that all the chivalric stuff was just window dressing for that, and it was an excuse and a way to build political power uh, with his knights. But I think uh, Maurice Keene would say that that's not the case. That's too, that's too bold a statement. Uh, my guess is that's both things. He truly pushed the chivalric expression, but he also was not unaware of the political expediency of this. Uh, the political usefulness of this might be a better way to put it. Um, and Edward I had made a point to connect their lineage with the Arthurian legend through heraldic means, um, through heralds connecting the line. And this does give you political legitimacy. And then if you go out and celebrate and make people more aware of the Arthurian past via round tables, then yeah, it's going to build your legitimacy. So it is part of a campaign in that regard. Um, but every time Edward came back with a victory, he would come back from either Scotland or uh, from France, and he would set up a series of round tables at those five spots that uh, were previously licensed under Richard and other spots too, but mainly those five. And they would do round table festivals or uh, bay hordes or tournaments um, with jousts um, to sort of rally up the population around it to spin them up. And these were events of high party time, as I mentioned. Um, there are bay hordes at all of these. Uh, Richard uh, Edward's known to have participated in them. Um, so you could envision, you know, the quartered fleur de lis and, and lions being done much like on the Black Prince's effigy in a quilted garment that might be used for bay hordes. It's been said that the Black Prince's coat armor was not, was for procession, but I wonder whether maybe it wasn't used for these baton tournaments. Um, and Rick, Edward's very good at this. He's a heck of a showman. He can get up there on stage and he can, you know, seize the audience and make the moment. And he really builds these things into a platform um, that will be continued on through the pot arms and these later tournaments um, as a focal point for the crown and for regional lords or whatever, and up and coming knights to really show their stuff. It was informal before, but this sort of represents some of the formality of what's going on and some of the, uh, um, the expense that increases. Because as we go, as they start out with just two groups of horsemen, it's expensive if you lose, but there's really not much expense to set it up. As we go on, there's more and more requirements. So in the age of Edward I, we start to have lists. We start to have um, barefois being set up, those uh, stands for the audience and whatnot. And so, because you want to make it so the ladies and heralds can see the action, well, that requires, you know, focusing the site. That all requires money. Um, and at those large events with lots of people, all sort of Vegas-like things are going to happen. So the church is going to frown on it as an event. Also, people are not being productive. They're actually burning resources. So the, these circuits that Edward made, uh, roundly, roundly, roundly condemned by the clerics. They really didn't like these. And one thing that Edward brought back from France were tight-fitting garments. Prior to this, these things are loose-fitting and so on. Well, my guess is that the steel leg or the iron leg harness brings up the necessity to have a tightly fitted garment to hold the thing up. And so from that, you have people lounging around in their arming garments that are fitted, which is quite unlike the regular civilian dress at the time. And then the women see that because theirs follows by about 10 years, and they want that too. And this um, becomes the start of a, a rash of clerical outpouring complaining about these tight-fitting clothes. 
Uh, if you look at the book by Stella Mary Newton, Fashion of the Black Prince, she's really good at documenting this. Um, but Edward brings that back. So you've got an environment now where the women are dressing up as boys. You've got the, the lots of drinking going on, tons and tons of wine. A ton is a measurement term, a big barrel. Um, and then you've got the feasting and the fighting and the merchants. It's just terrible as far as the church is concerned. But it works for Edward. Um, every time he comes back, he's wildly popular. Um, they're going to strengthen, in his view, part of his goal here is to strengthen up um, the chivalry of England. And in, in doing this, one of the things he'll do is he'll found the Order of the Garter. Oh, that should be 1348, not 1344. Typo, sorry about that. Um, and of course, he selects 26 knights. These are the knights who have been with him on campaign in Cressy and through the Chevauchet around it. Restricts the number to 26. Coincidentally, it's the 26 leaders of the realm. Um, and they're supposed to exhibit the sort of knightly qualities and then be held accountable for that to the other members of the order. To this end, he had a giant round table built at Windsor, um, starting in 1344. I was thinking where that name, that number was stuck in my head. And then he holds a large event there uh, later, instituting this Order of the Garter. They're still there at Windsor today. There's still the Garter Chapel is still there. Um, I've actually had the benefit of uh, sort of an amazing experience where I went to tour the place. We toured it, and we were looking up in the top and commenting on the great bassinets they have up in the top there and just being generally in awe of the place. That's where the Order of the Garter meets still to this day. Um, and the, the um, chaplain came out and asked if they were, said they were going to do an evening service. Would we like to stay for the service? Uh, well, I'm an Anglican anyway, so we uh, said, of course. And they actually put us in the Garter stalls. We're the only people in there uh, in the stalls. Um, so this is the Royal Castle at Windsor. We're in the Garter stalls having this church service. The pews were 14th century uh, from Edward's period. It was just amazing. Um, so Edward's, you know, resonance on that continues to come forward. The other garter still survives, as do some of the other ones, the Golden Fleece and so on. Um, and these things dovetailed with the tournament and the sort of German concept of a tournament company to sort of fuse and create an identity amongst the knights um, that was extremely powerful. And so this will lead Geoffrey Charnay, who writes in sometime between before 1356, because we know he dies then, is uh, Livre de Chevalerie, um, and he'll say that all deeds of arms merit praise for those who perform well in them. Now we've seen this idea develop all the way from the beginning with those two groups of horsemen all the way up through the mid 14th century here, where Edward's trying to take that renown and crystallize it even more with the knightly order. And so all these things are happening at the same time to sort of bring all this stuff together. And Charnay is not making this up. He's really recognizing, if you look in Romance and Chronicle, you'll see more confirmation for what he's saying here. This is really how they thought about it. But we have it from a knight's own mouth. And Charnay was a very, like William the Marshal, you started off in obscurity, becomes a royal counselor uh, as the, the brain behind the French's founding of the Order of the Star, which is their version of the Order of the Garter. Um, and then he dies carrying the Oriflamme at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, fighting the Black Prince. Um, the Oriflamme, when it's unfurled, meant that they weren't going to take any prisoners. And since he was carrying it, by the time that Jean, Jean's party was overrun, um, they didn't even seek his, uh, his surrender, not that he probably would have given it carrying that, and they cut him down. Um, so he was the real thing, and um, that's what he says about this, um, uh, the renown. So we've had kind of a whirlwind tour um, of tournaments and what they look like by the 14th century. And so to summarize, we start off with two groups of horsemen meeting with no rules. Gradually, you start to have specialized weapons, rebated weapons, the coronel on, um, on lances, possibly some special, uh, you know, wearing the curboily plates and things of that sort. You've gone from fighting between two towns to now fighting at one town or one place with a structure, a berfois, list, uh, heralds, ladies, all those things around the fighting. You still have jousting and you still have group combats, um, but you've now got a lot of heraldic expression. You've now got the opportunity for individual and group renown um, with these things. Um, and that will take us to the point where we've got round tables going on. You'll have bay hordes and jousts and tournaments all fighting at these round tables. And then um, you'll start to have the challenge format of the tournament, the pot arms that takes us into the next class that we did, um, showing up right at the end of this period. Um, so we've gotten from zero up through Charnay and 
uh, the early reign, or at least mid reign for Edward III. Uh, what questions do we have, or what points did you want to bring up? So actually, I had a question about livery. This more um, actually sure. came out of the pot of arms uh, thing, but um, you know, we see so much in movies with like guys in matching uniforms and matching livery. Um, what's kind of the historical? But I don't know how much would people match. How much would you, sure. would your suppliers sure. wear your your livery, things like that, and you know, sort of how would that equate to sort of a modern interpretation of it? Yeah, okay, that's fair. Um, we see the term livery actually show up in the 15th century um, during the Wars of the Roses. Obviously, they were much more bold about this. Although economics are a little different in the 15th century, um, following the plague, um, but the um, idea of coming out and wearing heraldic stuff. We have evidence of that, not only from the illuminations and whatnot, but also from inventory records, which signal a number of times Edward going out before events, both Edward the first and the third, would give livery uh, done up with a particular device on that livery. So cloaks and uh, viziers, we don't really know what that was. It could be a hat, it might be a torse or something, we don't actually know. Um, and then coats, um, pairs of plates with painting on it, uh, painted shields. So there is, even though the term wasn't livery, uh, there does seem to be uh, records of that going at least back as far as Edward I. I don't know that I've seen anything older than that. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, but that's kind of the earliest. And these are royal account books. So the crown obviously had money. Um, probably my guess is you're not going to see matchy matchy stuff uh, for Conraz until 1340, 1350, um, but it's hard to say. I mean, we don't, there was a lot of preparation done for these things as they become focused on towns and whatnot. And in so doing, they begin to harness more and more craftsmen involved in the display. And we know that they get more and more expensive as a whole. So, um, you know, for you doing it yourself, we know that goes all the way back to the 13th century. For you and your squires doing it, for example, or your men at arms, your household and stuff, that's probably, I would say, 1350 ish, but there was a little bit of it under Edward I. But probably not uniform the way we think of it. Now, if they made six jackets and they're all the same, they're probably going to be similar. Um, but there probably wasn't a lot of that um, prior to 1350 or so. If I had to put money on it, I would say the late 14th century, you're going to see much more of that for a contingent that's going to tournament. Because remember, Charnay talks about all the special equipment required um, for a tournament. And that would, in theory, include your squires, too. Um, and we know that often squires were given kerboily or linen armor so they could participate in the Vespers tournament or in the Bay Horde. And that may have been, I mean, if the guy is good, it would make sense renown wise to put it on, but we don't have a lot of specific records. The best place to look is really in illuminations, um, bearing in mind that the dating on those can be kind of funky depending upon what, uh, um, depending upon what you're kind of looking at. Yeah, I've been looking at ones, you know, the picture you've got up is a kind of a great example here, but uh, you know, like you don't see a lot of matching stuff uh, at least not the no. way we think about it. Um, you know, if talking about the Vespers Squires and the Vespers tournaments, would the Squires have, wouldn't they have their own arms, their own devices, or would they carry their, their knights? Yeah, that's not clear. Um, I have never seen, you know, I, I think that becomes much crisper as the 14th century rolls on, but I, I get the impression the rules were much looser prior to that. I mean, for these tournaments, sometimes the guys are not adopting their official arms. They're taking on the arms for the day, uh, something they want to say that day. So that may be extending to squires too, with the caveat that squires and men-at-arms have less money. And so they wouldn't necessarily have the, the expression. Uh, certainly they're not necessarily gonna have special armors and stuff for this. Although I think there's something to be said for the likelihood that um, wouldn't you start out training in something like that? Uh, which is where the big herd really come from anyway, since it's clear that it means an informal get together, a skirmish if you will, um, or a scrum or something like that. Um, even before it becomes formalized. So my instinct, even though it's hard to find sources on this, is that they were probably wearing the quilted linen stuff that we hear about, you know, an Akaton itself, and maybe mail over that. 
uh, but some sort of kerboily stuff because you could get kerboily easily, um, oiled leather instead of um, shelling out for iron necessarily. So that might be something they give you, not necessarily just before that tournament, but otherwise. But there might be something, you know, uh, surcoat in the earlier period or livery later, maybe. But I think it has to stick with a big maybe uh, until we dig stuff out. But I've been looking at the Latin and French sources. And I don't see much that's helping us. Any other ones? All right, then. Uh, let's see. So um, let's see if I can unshare this. Stop share. There we go. All right. So that sort of ends this first module. I think I'll do later another module that will focus on um, one of the other tournament formats. Maybe it'll focus on the round table or it'll focus on Edward III. Um, and we'll gradually move it up. I'd like to do ones on Jacques de Leling and the sort of emprises in the 15th century and that sort of thing. And then one on duels, maybe. Um, what else would you guys maybe like to see? I think that about covers it. Honestly. Which one would get priority? I don't know too much about how Edward III ran this tournament. I know more for the 14th and 15th century, but or later 14th and 15th, but Edward III would be interesting to hear about, as well as the Impreze. Sure. Yeah, Hastings writes that he's interested in the Impreze too. Um, and we have some decent sources on those, uh, so they're interesting. Jacques Leling especially fought in a number of those, and I've got some good sources in Monstrelet that we can pull from that. Um, and for people interested in the later fighting equipment especially, um, those are particularly interesting. It's the closest to what we think of as the harness effect in our deed of arms. So yeah, okay, we'll be looking at those as soon as you know breaks happen with work. So that suddenly got a little more uh, busy in the last few days, so. All right, I hope everyone's staying safe. I'll fold this one up, like the other ones, it'll go up on, uh, YouTube, as soon as it cooks, it'll take it a while to cook though. Um, and uh, put any comments you want into the, either the chat or into um, one of the threads, either on the SCA page or on the, uh, the Scola page. And I'll answer those as I get them. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks.